Darcy helps Jane into the carriage, and there's that little hand flex. Yep. <gasps> Oh my god, that is the most perfect shot in any movie yeah. throughout history. My, my wife yes, commented right? on that scene. She said, like, this is a big deal in the, like, fandom. It apparently. is a huge deal, Luke. Yes, yeah. it is. Welcome, friends, to episode 194 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm James. And I'm Luke. And this week, we discuss Joe Wright's 2005 film, Pride and Prejudice. We are so excited to be joined this week by a very special guest, author Jennifer Hudak. Her work has appeared on both the Locus Magazine and SFWA recommended reading lists and has been twice nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Uh, you can find her stories in Apparition Lit, Podcastle, Fla- Flash Fiction Online, and Metaphoroses Magazine, among others. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. So, Jen, you and I were classmates at the Viable Paradise Writers Workshop. I went to, gosh, I guess it's been a couple of years now. It has um, two and a half, right? Close two to and three. a half years. What is time? Um <laughs> And uh, yeah, I I was realizing today you are the first classmate I've had on the podcast. Oh, no way. Uh, Yeah, I had Daryl on, who who is an instructor, but not not a classmate yet. And I intend to have more on. I'm sure this will be the first of many. Um, But I think you're you're the perfect one to have on. Such a warm and genuine person. Um, Delighted to know you. And it's it's been a joy to follow how you've been publishing and just doing all these great things since we attended that workshop together. So... Uh, it's it's awesome to have you on. Well, I am so excited to be here, especially for this movie. So <laughs> good. Absolutely. I'm glad. Uh, speaking of that metaphorosis story, uh, the art of unpicking stitches, I believe it's called. Yes. Um, that story is one of the reasons I invited you on for this project, I, I, or I reached out to you to see if you would be interested in it. I should say. Um, I don't know. It just had it, to me. It had a, some similar vibes. Like there was a certain warmth to it. Um, there was some some like sisterly bonds, um, that kind of stuff. And I don't know, it just made me think of, made me think of you. So, um, Aww, and the father daughter yeah. relationship too, yeah, right? That kind of father daughter bond. Yeah. So out of curiosity, what is your history with this material? Uh, we want to hear about your thoughts on the book. So I, well, I mean, I read Pride and Prejudice years and years and years ago when I was in high school obviously that was a long time ago had you uh seen any adaptations first or did you read the book first uh yes none existed back then thank you really Luke. <laughs> i mean i thought there was like there i thought that this is one, one of those things yeah. that has had like 40 adaptations i mean there might have been like a 19 i think there was like someone in the 1950s or something okay, like okay. that but i graduated high school in 89 so that was before the 95 bbc version came out um so that would have been the biggie you know that was like the formative one for a lot of my a lot of my friends the colin firth version um but no i i read it um in high school i think it was the first austin book i'd read actually um and in the 90s there were a spate of Austin adaptations, like various Austin adaptations um, that I became very, very excited about. Um, And I did see the 95 BBC miniseries, binged it with a friend over lots of pizza. This movie, you know, when by the time this movie came out, the 2005 movie, I, you know, was already... uh, married and had two kids and kind of sneaking time to watch this in the basement when my kids were (laughs) sleeping um but yeah so I've I've uh I've I read the book I actually reread the book before uh when I knew I was going to be on this podcast because I I honestly think that I had not read the book since I was in high school oh wow Um, even though I've seen this movie so many times Mm -hmm. um so it was really fun for me to go back to the source material and I remembered quite a lot of it, but um, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. This is one of the rare occasions where I felt like 
I might have enjoyed the book even more had I read it after seeing mm-hmm. the adaptation. Um, I mean, on this podcast, we read the book first, and I, I do like doing that normally. But here, like, there was something really cool about seeing these characters brought to life, and the language is a little bit dated these days. Um, and to see it performed, you know, masterfully, like, really brings it to life and shows the inherent beauty in the language. And if I had seen this adaptation and then read the book, I think I would have gotten even more out of it, um, just personally. So uh, I'm really curious what your what your thoughts were on the book real quick, uh, going back to it after all this time. Like, d- did you have a different experience with it? I did. Um, so I remember in high school not loving it when I was in high school, Um it, you know, it's a lot of like, then they went here and then they went there. And then, they, you know, um, a lot of it is told through letters, which mm-hmm. again is just, it's just a very different style. Um, and I remember just kind of getting through it when I was in high school, for sure. I feel like v- really weird admitting that, by the way. But. I think I think it's, a, it's something to do with being forced to read things in school is a totally different experience. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to comment on on what you're saying, Luke, about the modernizing of the film, too, because it does feel like something that maybe caters to a mo- more modern audience. But it'll be interesting to see like how it holds up over time, because I think Jane Austen's novel has survived such a long time, even though maybe the language is a little different than it used to be. And to see, you know, something as modern and, and, and you know, it does like an updating more modern version while also still leaning into some of the some of the more uh, late 18th century tendencies in speech. But it reminded me of watching a Shakespeare adaptation. Yes. You know, yeah. that, that was what I definitely although even like I think the language is not as removed as that is. Right. Obviously. So so not e- that's not even a, quite a one to one. But that is what I was thinking of, like watching a Hamlet or watching something mm-hmm. like that and going like, oh, you know, I can really see this now. Um, very cool. Um, and so I don't know if you listened to any of our last episode, but James and I are completely new to Austin and mm. adap- and in any of the adaptations. I don't think have you have you seen any other Austin adaptations, James? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, and this you've was my seen, first time. You've seen like Clueless. And, yeah, that's what yeah, I was gonna I say. Mean, I've that's... seen some that are like maybe maybe inspired Wait, by, but not quite cl- adaptations. Clueless is. Yes. All right, you Emma. have to explain this to me. Yes. Clueless is inspired by Emma. Yeah, it's an Emma adaptation. Wow. It really is. If you if you read Emma and you can hey. map characters. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We, we might, might have we some. Might have to, we might have to do that. You should totally <laughs> that do sounds, that. Yeah. That sounds very fun. Well, there's been a there's a modern a modern adaptation that I mean, not that Clueless isn't modern, but there's a there's a more recent adaptation uh, that got great reviews that I also mm-hmm. haven't seen. I wanted I'd love to see that as well. Is it for Emma? And that one's yeah, that one's yeah. super mm-hmm. faithful to the book. I mean, right. that okay. one's m- much more faithful to the book than than this Pride and Prejudice is to the book. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're uh, complete novices to this, and I went into it really not knowing what to expect other than it's one of my wife's favorite movies, and she was very excited, and we watched it together, um, and so I was able to like vicariously get all of her joy <laughs> um, as she enjoyed this movie. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a good place to lead us into more general thoughts um about the movie what did you think let's start with james Uh, i'm really curious what you thought uh watching it this time yeah so um after reading the novel i was like man i really like i didn't engage with it quite as as deeply as i thought i might like i was like i I thought i was going to be just overtaken and and want to read like every romance like sort of novel of this of this type every jane austen novel and i do want to read more jane austen but Something about it left me feeling like, oh man, like I wonder if the ad- I'm gonna feel similarly about the adaptation. I don't. I love the adaptation. Uh, I thought it was it, like we've talked about it being modernized in many ways. It, it catered to me as like a someone who doesn't watch a ton of romance, in that it has tons of intriguing things going on. This, as somebody who loves film, the set design is incredible. The costuming is incredible. The cast is unbelievable. Um, I, I, I was pretty blown away and uh, found myself getting, you know, more so than, than in the novel, getting swept up in the romance a little bit. I was like, it was pulling on the heartstrings. And I was like, wow, mm. this is, I really like it as an adaptation. And, and like, I, I'm sure that like Jane Austen purists will say that it's been sort of like watered down because there's a lot of like the subplots that are 
not quite as important. And, you know, just I, I think part of Jane Austen's novel is like living in that world and, and like experiencing the political uh, or like social constructs in such a way that this this movie just doesn't have time to do. But ultimately, I had such a great time with it. How about you, Jen? Oh, gosh, I, I adore this movie. Um, and yes, you're right that there are Jane Austen purists who do not like this movie. Mm. Um, there are <laughs> there are also Colin Firth purists who do yeah, not like yeah. this movie. I've, that's a whole uh, thing, right? Like the oh, there's like a, a, these two adaptations, like people yes. have favorites and they're very adamant about them. It is like team Colin versus <laughs> yeah. But um I I love this adaptation so much and I do feel like um the best adaptations are their own art form. I know you guys feel that way too. So like, you know, things that work in a novel aren't necessarily going to work on screen and vice versa. And I really like overall the choices that um, were made on this as a movie. Um, mm -hmm. the, the long tracking shots um, throughout the balls and in the house, just really getting you a sense to immerse yourself in the setting. Um, some of the... I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but some of the little shorthand kind of um, cut shots that just do so much work. Um, so yeah, I and I, I the cast was phenomenal. Um, I thought they there were harder edges I felt in the novel in a lot of the characters, and in the movie they softened some of those edges in such a way that you felt more sympathetic towards some of the characters that you maybe didn't in the book. And I thought that that was a really, really great choice too. So just in terms of like mo changing things for the film in adaptation, I read something about um, there's a scene in the book that's supposed to be based around art and there's a lot of paintings that are involved. And the switch to that scene in the movie being more of sculptures and like a three-dimensional space and the way that you can interact like blocking wise interact with a character and like maybe a statue or something like that i thought was so cool so yeah just like the the attention to what works for the adaptation not necessarily what you know is perfectly in line with what jane wrote i thought was i, I liked it i found this movie to be warm and comforting and inviting um, and, and I kind of expected it to be that way, but it far exceeded my expectations. Um, I also found it to be an incredibly sensory movie. Um, obviously, I, you can see and hear a film, but I felt like I could smell and taste and, and feel the warmth uh, of the sun. Like there, there, It was did such a good job of transporting me to this place and this time. Um, and and that, I think that's an achievement in and of itself. And... Um, I know I'll be liking it to a favorite of ours on the podcast, but it reminded me a little bit of the opening of Lord of the Rings and, and mm. being in Hobbiton and how just warm and inviting I always love the opening to uh, the Fellowship of the Ring to be. And uh, a lot of those like ball scenes and the dancing and the feasting and the all the just elaborate uh, costuming, it just it gave me a similar vibe and, and I totally like that. And I, I can see why people find this movie so comforting and why people rewatch it so frequently. I'm excited to tell you both, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is Joe Wright's feature film debut. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. I had read that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I stay amazing. away from, I tried not to learn, read anything about the movie so I can be surprised, <laughs> so I'll be the complete noob here who knows nothing. So, no, I know nothing about him as a filmmaker, honestly. And to me, it feels, I didn't know that until after when I was looking looking into it, and that's it's such a confident film you can tell like he he has a confidence to him and he really understood what he was going for and changed it in a way to make it his own and i think that was a deliberate decision to um change it as a as a first time filmmaker he, he wanted it to be a joe wright film not a jane austen adaptation and so i think there was like a specific in the way that he was shooting in the way that like maybe some of the scenes were less subtle in the in the movie but more dramatic for mm -hmm. a, a film like this yeah, there was a almost a melodrama at times uh, to especially some of the bigger, more emotional moments, but it didn't bother. Like it felt appropriate for the material and for the tone of the film. 
Um, you know, you have the rain and you have the dramatic, right. you know, it's, it's but it, it, it's such a big story and it's so classic and timeless. Like it, it felt appropriate to me, but mm-hmm. I can see that maybe some people that could rub the wrong way. Some of brought the, the sort of broadness of the story at times or this adaptation at times. Um, but it didn't bother me personally. Um, I found the movie to be funnier than I expected. Um, I genuinely had some laugh out loud moments that I noted, um, which we can talk about when we get to specific scenes. Um, and I teared up during this movie. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I felt, I felt genuine connection and, and investment in some of these relationships. And, um, I was pleasantly surprised with just how much I was taken with this movie. So yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was very good. There was a, a scene, um, towards the middle, just as in talking about like the environment and the sets and the costuming and immersing you in the world that I didn't even notice. I've seen this movie so many times and I didn't even notice it until last night when I was, re- or two nights ago when I was rewatching it. Um, it was after the ball at Netherfield and there. um, dyeing their ribbons using beets. There's a bowl of beets on the table and you can see that they're hanging up their ribbons, that they're just kind of dyeing them to reuse them for a different color, which is just this tiny, tiny detail, which I I felt like it just blew me away how much information that gives you both about the family and their circumstances and also just life in general at that Mm -hmm. time. And that attention to detail is present throughout. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. no expert on the on the era. I'm sure there are mistakes, but there, so much of it just felt uh, just really carefully placed and chosen mm-hmm. to evoke that time period and that that lifestyle. Uh, the movie is set slightly earlier than the book is. Really, um, I didn't I catch had, that. Yeah, that was a choice that he made. That the director made. Um, he called it something like the, the muddy hem version of history, as opposed to really prim proper Regency, um, because the Bennett's are landed gentry. I mean, they're, they're kind of in this movie, they're a little bit more country bumpkinish, um, which again, like I have no, I have no problem with that choice. I'm not a a huge Austin purist. And I think Mm -hmm. it, it does a, it was a good choice to kind of get across the, the uh, differences in the different social classes. Um, it is much more broad for sure than the book, but it was not a, a, a choice that I minded at all. That's kind of a nuanced thing that you have to get into in the book. Like the difference in these, in the social standing where to the outsider, you're like, well, you're both like super rich landed right? gentry types. <laughs> like what's the big deal? Whereas this made it more obvious, right? Like the differences in status. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about just the, the attention to detail. And one of the things that was standing out to me a lot was the actual locations when they were shooting on location. And I found a lot about it. Um, I'm not going to be able to get super into it. But I will say if you I watched a lot of the bonus features on the on the uh, movie and they basically go through each of the major locations and will give you like a rundown because a lot of them are like historic places in Europe, uh, typically in England. And so one of them is called Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, England. Um, and it has been the family home of, home of the Duke of Devonshire and his family since 1549. So just thinking of getting these massive film crews in there with heavy equipment and everything. And they built, I think they built like facades for a lot of the walls in order to like make the kitchen. They, I actually saw some footage of them like kind of tearing out the kitchen to add wow. things that were like period specific to when this would have been taking place. But just like, I mean, to be able to film in a location like that with that much history there was another place also um, called Wilton House, Wiltshire, that was also used for interiors. So incredible stuff. And and a lot of the exteriors, specifically, I saw one about where the where the Bennets live. Mm. The exteriors used in the c- symmetry with the lake and everything and like just an yeah, amazing so. looking piece of property and, and like tons of history. They said something about how they wanted to use it largely because it had been basically untouched for close to 300 years so you know around the time that this would have been written wow perfect so if you if you guys are ready we can jump more into joe wright yeah Mm -hmm. i'm curious joe wright is a british film director his motion pictures include the literary adaptations pride and prejudice and anna karenina the romantic war drama atonement the action thriller hannah peter pan origin story pan and darkest hour I've seen Atonement from that list. That's the mm-hmm. only one. And that, I think, is an adaptation too, right? Were you, was that yeah. listed as an adaptation? Of an, Ian yeah. McE- an Ian McEwan novel. That's cool. That That's one that's on our list, I believe, that we might have to tackle at some point. I think it's uh, the adaptation is Kira Knightley as well. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And also Anna Karenina, 
right? Yeah, she might also be in that too. I didn't see that one. One of those situations where a director just likes working with somebody? I think so, yeah. I mean, she's clearly, she was 20, by the way, in this film. Uh, and she, I thought she gave just a great performance, really yeah, unbelievable stuff. So Joe Wright began his career working at his parents' puppet theater. He also took classes in theater school and acted professionally on stage and camera. He spent an art foundation year at Camberwell College of Arts before taking a degree in fine art and film at Central St. Martin's, where he was tutored by Malcolm Lee Grice and Vera Neubauer. In his last year of studies, he received a scholarship to make a short film for the BBC that won several awards. On the success of the short, he was offered the script for the serial Nature Boy. He followed this up with the serials Bodily Harm with Timothy Spall and the highly acclaimed Charles II, The Power and the Passion with Rufus Sewell, which won the BAFTA Award for Best Drama Serial. During the 1990s, he worked at Oil Factory, a music video production company based in Caledonian Road, King's Cross. He worked on a variety of productions in numerous roles, including casting director. Here, he was able to get the opportunity to, the opportunity to direct some music videos. Alongside this, particularly on the strength of his short film work, he was also developing the end, his second short film. Wright won a BAFTA award for, the, for Best Newcomer for Pride and Prejudice and was the youngest director to have opened the Venice Film Festival with Atonement. So often we hear about directors getting started with music videos. It really yeah. seems like if, you're, if you want to get started in directing, like direct some music videos. It, it's they're great, like yeah. little short films, right? You know? It totally is. And, and tons of creative freedom. Uh, you can, you know, they can be so psychedelic or they can be so off the wall or so dramatic and they can basically be a movie into themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, the last thing here is according to the director's commentary on Pride and Prejudice Wright is influenced by the work of British film director David Lean and possessing a certain knowledge of art history tries sometimes to compose his shots after classical paintings uh, I caught that by the way I, that was one of my things I was I was waiting to bring up but <laughs> there were several moments where I felt like we are we are evoking a classic painting here um, I think the the most the clearest example is when uh, Elizabeth is spinning on that uh, swing and we keep getting these shots of this like courtyard mm-hmm. and there's just very like interesting picturesque things going on. There's there's like a little boat in a, in a little puddle at one point and there's like chickens and these farmers and horses and it, and it looks like, I don't know, just really incredible. And I was like, this is definitely evoking some specific painting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another time Elizabeth was sitting on a couch and she was looking a certain direction, wearing a certain dress, and the painting behind her on the wall was very similar. Not this, exactly the same, but it was very similar to where I thought like they were almost evoking that specific painting, and they just had it in the shot to kind of be a little clue. Uh, I thought it was very cool. <laughs> yeah, and I love to see this kind of stuff, because the difficulty in actually like framing up something like that and then being able to execute is is it's a super high level of difficulty, and... Um, I, th- I I keep thinking of a lot of these like sprawling landscape shots where like Darcy and Bingley are kind of talking and they're they're by the lake at the mm. Bennett's property yeah. and the way that like the sun is hitting the lake and they're like silhouetted almost. Um, I, I just thought all of that looked incredible and, and kind of reminds me of something you would see as like a landscape portrait of people. Yeah. And, you know, it reminds me the other director. I think the only other director we've covered who did something like this is Alfonso Cuaron mm. in Children of Men. Remember the, like some of those scenes, uh, I think specifically in the barn, and like there was a couple of moments where it felt like he was evoking these like Renaissance paintings, mm-hmm. and um, I, I remember just being so taken with well, that. And that that had a lot of like religious allegory too, mm-hmm. stuff in that in that story. Yeah, and 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 this I think is evoking a certain time and a certain frame of mind and a certain um, classiness <laughs> almost <laughs> to and grand grand grandiosity. There we go. <laughs> There were four nominations for Oscars for this film. Keira Knightley was nominated for Best Actress. Uh, Best Art Direction was another. Best Costume Design and Best Original Score. Oh, yeah. We didn't even touch on the score. I, mm-hmm. I thought this it was so... It perfectly married that vibe I was talking about that I was getting from this movie. The piano... It was a mostly piano score. I'm sure there was plenty of strings at different times, but, like, I don't know. It just... It, just, it was so perfect for this film. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and something that that I didn't pick up on when I was watching it, but I saw in my research is that people say that 
Keira Knightley, when she's being, when her character Elizabeth is being asked to play the piano, is p- playing sort of like an off-tune, mistake-ridden version of the score yeah, of the film. Yeah, it's, it's actually a simplified version. Okay. It's kind oh. of like an easy piano version <laughs> That's of awesome. the main theme of, of, of the song that um, Georgiana plays mm-hmm. later. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't, so doesn't, cool. uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, his Darcy's sister, sister. Darcy's yeah. sister plays that in, in like yeah, a, the but, more but elaborate the, the version. Yeah, the full version, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very cool. Just, again, attention to detail. And that score fits perfectly with this film. I think it evokes like the, you know, rises and falls at the right times, which is something that I wanted to talk about with the cinematography of the film is that it's so... I, I think it, I thought it brought so much to the scenes in terms of mirroring what was going on within the scene. Like we've kind of touched on the the rain scene, but that scene is incredible. Yeah. And uh, another one that comes to mind is like Elizabeth and uh, Catherine DeBoer are like having that argument yeah. in the candlelight that I talked about last week. I was like, I was expecting candlelit like <laughs> intense <laughs> moments. But yeah, yeah, the intensity of that extreme close ups um, like candlelit with only half their face sort mm-hmm. of revealed to be intimidating or something like that and i, yeah. I thought that it uh, the the cinematography was fantastic we got to get into specifics now because i'm ready to leap into some of these scenes <laughs> yeah all right let's do it so i'll start with the first of three sections here during the late 18th century mr and mrs bennett and their daughters jane elizabeth mary kitty and lydia live in rural england mrs bennett eager to secure her daughter's futures through suitable marriages, is delighted when the wealthy bachelor, Charles Bingley, moves into nearby Netherfield. At an assembly ball, Bingley, his sister Caroline, and his friend Mr. Darcy meet the local society. Bingley and Jane are taken with each other, while Elizabeth instantly dislikes the snobbish Darcy and overhears him his dismissive remarks about her. Later, visiting the Bingleys, Jane falls ill and must stay to recuperate. At Netherfield to see Jane, Elizabeth verbally spars with the haughty Caroline and the aloof Darcy. Mr. Bennett's cousin, Mr. Collins, a pompous clergyman, visits the Bennett's. As the closest male relative, Collins will inherit the Bennett's estate. Mr. Collins intends to propose to Jane, but Mrs. Bennett says Jane will soon be engaged and instead suggests Elizabeth. The Bennett sisters also meet the handsome and charming Lieutenant Wickham who is connected to the Darcy family and wins Elizabeth's sympathy by claiming Mr. Darcy denied him his rightful inheritance. So let's start off with Jen. Uh, what do you think of the opening of this film? What do you think of uh, uh, the portrayal of all these characters? So the, the f- I think the, you know, the, the one thing about the book is the, the first scene is it does a ton of work from the very first line. And I think that this movie does a great job of capturing this just kind of hectic household um, and the relationships that, because there's, you know, how many sisters, four sisters, five sisters, five and the five sisters and the parents, it's a lot of people and they all have different relationships with each other and with the whole. So the very first shot is of Elizabeth with a book um, just kind of establishing her right away as maybe a little bit different. You know, she's even though in the book she mentions she's not a huge reader, but in in the in the movie they're they're establishing her as a reader. Um, I thought that right away, you know, Mr. Bennett is established as someone a little bit kinder than his book counterpart. He's I think teasing. So. Mm-hmm. He's kind of long suffering and teasing, yeah. but he's kind. Yeah. Um, he wants to do best by his daughters. Um, I liked him in the book, but this version, just he really won me over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the book, he's more funny. But yeah. in this one, yeah, he's... And then, of course, you have um, all five sisters are immediately distinct mm-hmm. in the way that they're reacting to the news about Bingley and to the ball. Um, I just thought it was a, it was a really great way to immediately... Oh, and, and there's that tracking shot right at the beginning, too, right? When Elizabeth is walking by the house. I don't even know if that's the correct terminology to use. Is that correct, the tracking shot? Yeah, there's, I, like, there's I, I like believe the so. There's the continuous shot that moves through the house, all the rooms, and then back outside. And then you see Elizabeth continuing on her walk, which also just situates, her, situates the viewer. Right. Um, I, are you saying world. it's a, it's like a one like it doesn't cut away? Yeah. 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 Those are always yeah. fun. And, and and they take a lot of work. We we've we've raved about a few on this podcast before different different moments. Um 
I, you know, it's funny. I guess I didn't catch this one. It's it's so funny how sometimes you don't notice, um, especially on your first watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, that's the kind of thing I think if I watched again, I would probably stand out to me even more. Yeah, Jen, uh, typically tracking shot and Warner is interchangeable, so you're definitely correct. Okay. Uh, because to, to track someone, you're not going to cut away. Okay, yeah. I didn't know. I'm just making sure I know it. what's being discussed right. here. So, but there is, so to speak about Warners, though, there's one very famous one that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But first, let me jump in on the book Easter egg that you guys are going to absolutely love. At the beginning of the movie, the book that Jen mentioned that Elizabeth is reading is a novel titled First Impressions. Ah. which Luke and I talked about last week, was the uh, Jane Austen's original title for Pride and Prejudice. Excellent. Um, so supposedly, if you look at the text that's visible in the pages, it's readable if you pause it. And people say it's the last chapter of Pride and Prejudice with the names changed. Oh, my god! <laughs> it's so funny that they went to the, to the, to the work of, of changing the names so that it wouldn't dispel the yeah. the immersion even though like who's gonna stop it and read like, so <laughs> props, crazy props department like. they're serious man props department yeah. want to make sure that everything's uh on the up and up um that's so cool so the one or i'm realizing actually we'll have to get to in a little bit because it takes place a little bit later but what okay. do you guys think about um the initial interaction between uh darcy and elizabeth did it work for you did it because i felt like darcy was like of course he was kind of snobbish right away but I felt like he was more likable much more quickly in the movie. He seemed much more um, like coded as very socially awkward and yeah. uncomfortable from the get go um, rather than just haughty. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. I do think in that very first ball, he's pretty unlikable, um, e- even though like, yeah, you can maybe read it, especially after having seen the movie. I think you can go back and read it as mm-hmm. just being awkward. But he just came off as very dour and aloof. And, um, you know, saying what he says about Elizabeth is you know pretty awful. So definitely um, they do a good job of making you not not really like the guy very much. Um, on the other hand, Bingley, I thought is way more likable in this in this version, um, at least than I remember him in the book. Um, he's kind of just like a lovable doofus and, um, I don't know, kind of himbo energy, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, and like, I can see how people might really like him. And, uh, it's an interesting pairing to have him with Rosamund Pike, um, as Jane, who, uh, we've talked about, uh, uh, in Gone Girl. Mm-hmm. And I was having, I don't know if you had this problem, James, I was having some trouble seeing her as this sort of innocent, sister after that movie <laughs> and like some of the stuff we've seen her in she reminded me of uh, of like uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing kind of deal like I-, I can see the 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 danger that she portrayed in other movies here um and i know that that's a problem of just like my my uh, uh prejudice from seeing other movies that she's been in um but i don't know it was, it was, it was interesting because she plays such a sort of um shy uh lovable uh role here and um i kept expecting like some of that fierceness to come out i'm so used to seeing it in her and i don't know i i liked her in this role but it it just felt like she has so much more potential that i'm glad that she got to to put on screen in other movies um and i'm really excited to see her in wheel of time um uh, as as a role that i really like in moraine uh, very excited for that yeah, she. I thought she was excellent. I definitely can see what you're talking about, but it, it uh, didn't hold me back from buying her performance. Like I thought, I felt like I was really into it, and you know, she she had to sell some things later in the story where it's like, um, you know, she's needing to put on a strong face, but then also like dealing with some. You know, she's even telling her family members like, "I'm I'm totally fine when things have already you know not gone well for her." Yeah, and uh, we talked about like the how this movie deals with like gender roles and stuff and how that character i can i can understand you saying like eventually she would get more range she'd be she'd be able to do more and have more agency as a character in other movies but uh i totally bought this i thought she was great i thought i bought her as innocent and she seemed really bubbly and like i bought that like their relationship took off like right away yeah this is a a, it's a hard role i mean it it, because it is she is basically the perfect daughter is Mm -hmm. basically what she is um she's 
completely, she has the sense of decorum. She's, um, and, and so I think it's actually a, a deceptively difficult role to play. This was the first thing I had seen her in. So I had yeah. never seen her in anything else. And I was super impressed when I saw this. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think this is a good performance. I guess for me, it's like, um, like, okay, this is an extreme example, but um, after watching Jack Nicholson in The Shining, if you were to go back and watch him in a role where he's just this lovable guy, like you would, you would have a little bit of this like right. baggage. Sure, of course. And, and right, her role it, yeah. in Gone Girl to me just it, it, it imprinted on me so strongly that I kept seeing that character somehow in this person. Anyway, it, it's, it's more of a me problem. <laughs> we're talking a lot about cast. I definitely want to talk about a couple other people. Carrie Mulligan. Uh, this is her, this is her feature film debut also. And I wanted to mention her because I've told Luke to watch um, Promising Young Woman. Oh, yeah. Because I you seen absolutely it yet. have to watch that movie. And yeah. to talk about like a character, I don't know. I just, I, I think you should absolutely watch it. Wait, and to so, see who, the, so who does she play in this movie? She is Kitty. Kitty, Kitty okay. The youngest, or, or the, she's not the youngest, but Lydia's little sidekick. Yeah. They're always giggling. Is she the one who's like giggling all the time? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's her. That's amazing. What a, what a cast because I think the youngest is also um, prominent in Westworld. Yes. Um, you know, so like the, all these Tallulah. people have gone on to have these like really cool careers and I mean, some of them are still yeah. just getting started, but like so, very cool to see. This part of what why I wanted to bring this up is they apparently in the in the behind the scenes, they show footage of these uh, all of the basically the Bennett family coming together and they were allowed to go to the location once the sets had completely been period specific set to period specific and basically play they, they played hide and seek as like a bonding exercise like all of the <laughs> sisters and the family they played hide and seek in that house that's supposed to be their house as like a and getting to see them run around and seeing all of these actors who are just incredible and have gone on to have amazing careers i was i was just like that just looks like so much fun to have been on that set um and i think it did build a strong chemistry they i bought them as a family um and uh, two other people I want to mention, Brenda Blethyn, who plays Miss Bennett, I thought was great because we talked about she kind of plays she kind of has a ridiculous role to play in the story in the book. And I thought she brought like a lot of heart to it and made it like she seemed like a mother. She and, and like, <laughs> I know it's dramatic, but when she's like in the bed and she's like, oh, I'm going to, yeah. you know, I can't I can't take all of this. I just thought it was it was a great performance as a funny, very again, funny, yeah. again. Uh, I mean, she's a lot. But that becomes uh, sort of adorable and and funny, uh, even though you can also sort of feel for her daughters or like, oh, man, this must be a lot to deal with all the time. Yeah. And speaking of Donald, Donald Sutherland brought a lot to this role that I thought was it was incredible, just in terms of like being this like father who is trapped in the in the moment there where society acts a certain way and he's the patriarch of the family. And yet, like, he's so caring for everyone. He's, like, ultimately does, you can see, like, the genuine want for him to to have all of his daughters happy in their own specific ways. There's one other scene in the first part that we have to talk about. Yeah. What's that? And it's, and it's after um, Jane has been sick at Netherfield and Elizabeth goes to visit her. Um, and then they're going home after mm-hmm. Jane recovers. And Darcy helps Jane into the carriage, and there's that little hand flex. Yep. <gasps> oh my god, <laughs> that is the most perfect shot in any movie. Yeah. Throughout history, my my wife reckon like uh, yes, commented right? on that scene. She said like this is a big deal in the like fandom. It apparently. is a huge deal, Luke. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes. So I was reading that like the sort of focus on Darcy's hand was like in the director saying like what everyone is after is like Darcy's hand Mm. in terms of like being married and things like that. So like the keying in of the hand, there's something that happens at the end that deals with hands and and it it continues to be a thing. And it's just that one slight interaction where he helps her into the carriage. And then as he's walking away, that like flex, which I don't really know what to make of it. I obviously he's like excited, but I would love to know what you guys thought. But it's also like a, it's like a discomfort. It's like a, oh my gosh, like yeah. I just touched this person on her skin, yeah, and I can see that. Yeah. And sh- and she has that reaction too, because there's that close up of her face where she turns and looks at him. It's just I, so <laughs> I have personally. Uh, rewound and watched that scene over again several times over the course of the watching of That's the movie awesome. just 
full disclosure on that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of, I mean, it's like kind of cliche when you start talking about it in these terms, but it's that electricity of that first touch. And I think mm-hmm. it shows the potential is there for this to be a magical romance, right? And and in almost a supernatural way, they feel that connection when they touch hands. Mm-hmm. And and it, it changes everything, I think, from that moment on. You can see that both characters see something in each other that maybe they didn't see before that. And I think, too, it just it does a lot of work in terms of Darcy's character because he yeah. is this gentleman, right? And he's rich and he's got everything. But she has disarmed him in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's really important. I also think in that first section you see we meet Collins, right? We meet Mr. Collins. um, And Mr. Collins and Mary and Darcy are all coded as being very, very socially awkward in very different ways. But they're all in this adaptation. Even Collins are sympathetic in ways that they Mm -hmm. aren't necessarily in the book. And I think that's a choice in the movie. Um, I think that's a deliberate choice in the movie yeah. to make them not types in that way. And I think that that also influences how we feel about Darcy because we kind of see lots of people struggling to exist in this in this uh, society that has such strict social rules. Right. Yeah. So behind closed doors, everyone's struggling with it, but nobody wants to say anything because it's not in vogue. Like you need to just like be a part of the culture in that way. Right, yeah. right. I, I I completely agree about uh, Mr. Collins. Like he is so weird <laughs> early on. He, he's, Poor he's, guy. I, he has his special attention. He's going to pay somebody, and you're like, oh god. And yeah. um, he just seems so off putting. I love the haircut, by the way. The haircut choice was incredible. Yeah, the, <laughs> the haircut really sells it. And, and uh, you know, the guy's been sort of typecast. He's he's way shorter than all the male leads. Um. So and then yeah, like. There's like a certain point, I think it's at one of the balls and you start to see the awkwardness for what it is and you start to feel sorry for him and you start to mm-hmm. feel like he's just trying his best to to do the things he needs to do. He's just kind of an odd guy. And yeah, I totally turned around and, and I liked him in a way that I never felt for the character in the book. I yeah. totally agree with that. There, there's really only one villain, which we'll get to um, mm-hmm. in this in this movie. Um, and I think that was a choice because it just gives you a lot of characters to have affection for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you both if the, so the moment of the hand flex, just to go back to that for a second, mm-hmm. did Elizabeth see that or did we as the audience just see that in like a private m- moment? I was under the impression that she saw it because of the close-up of her face as she kind of turned to look at him as he walked away. Mm-hmm. But you're right. It's it's unclear I, how private that moment was. Yeah, I, I guess I took it to more that she didn't see it, but she, I think she felt it, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's what's right. most important. They had a moment, and I think they at least exchange looks. Um, mm-hmm. Whether or not she sees the hand flex I, I, um, is unclear. And, and honestly, I think I kind of like it if she doesn't because there is still that uncertainty. It's mm-hmm. like we felt something, but was it the same for him as it was for me? I don't know. Um, but it, yeah. it could mean, I mean, I remember the first time I saw this movie and that hand flex could be interpreted as kind of like, ew, you know, Maybe. like I just touch someone that I find beneath me and... Yeah, so I, I think that that's why I'm saying that I think that hand flex does so much work because it it shows his awkwardness, it shows the connection, but it also shows that she might still be seeing him as someone who's just snobby and doesn't want to have anything to do with her. Yeah, because that's her impression of him. Mm-hmm. Well, at and, this point, still. And from a storytelling sort of filmmaker point of view, I think it was really smart to directly call attention to the hand something that you know you're going to be circling back to Mm -hmm. as the story progresses. Yeah. Speaking of the story progressing, at the Netherfield Ball, Elizabeth accepts Darcy's invitation to dance, though the encounter is strained. The next day, Collins proposes to Elizabeth, who soundly rejects him. Despite her mother's anger, her father supports her decision. The Bingley party unexpectedly returns to London. Elizabeth urges Jane to visit their aunt and uncle, the gardeners who live in London, hoping she reconnects with Bingley. Elizabeth is astonished when her friend Charlotte announces she is engaged to Mr. Collins. 
Months later, Elizabeth visits Charlotte and Mr. Collins, who reside on Lady Catherine de Bourges' estate. Elizabeth unexpectedly meets Darcy, who is Lady Catherine's nephew, and is visiting his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam. Unaware that Jane is Elizabeth's sister, Fitzwilliam mentions that Darcy recently untangled Bingley from an imprudent match with an unsuitable family. Distraught, Elizabeth is then met by Darcy, who surprisingly proposes marriage, declaring his ardent love despite her inferior rank. Offended and angry, she refuses him. He defends separating Jane and Bingley, believing Jane indifferent. Elizabeth also cites his mistreating Wickham, leaving Darcy angry and heartbroken. He later delivers her a letter describing Wickham's true character. Wickham squandered the bequest Darcy's father left him, then attempted to seduce Darcy's 15-year-old sister, Georgiana, into eloping to gain her fortune. So we're going to talk about the Netherfield ball, right? Yeah, let's talk about the ball for sure. Let's do it. That has another one of those long tracking shots through the yeah. ball. Um, and it follows, I think one of them, I think it might have a couple, because I think one of them follows Elizabeth as she's looking for Wickham. Mm-hmm. And another one, um, I can't remember, I think it follows several characters, but you see Mrs. Bennett kind of drunk walking through, spilling things on people. You see... Mary trying to play the piano for people and kind of making a fool of herself and then later crying and Mr. Bennett consoling her, which was just a moment I loved. You see Mr. Collins walking through in search of Elizabeth and then sitting there dejected with his flower. <laughs> it's just such a great scene. Yeah. I, when I first saw Mr. Bennett um, consoling her, I, I, I guess I kind of misread the scene because he is the one who tells her she needs to stop playing. But then my wife pointed out that like the women who were circled around her were kind of laughing at her. Yeah. Maybe she yes. didn't realize it. He was trying to save so her. So he was kind of saving her. Cause at first I thought like, well, you were the one who was kind of mean to her, but then, and then I, I, yeah, I think that recontextualized it for me. So I, I do like that. Yeah. Yeah. So Mary in the book is just very studious and a little, almost like a little haughty. Mm -hmm. um, and she's very socially awkward in this adaptation. And there's a line earlier um, when they're all sitting at um, Netherfield when Jane is sick, um, where Mary says that she thinks that conversation instead of dancing should be the order of the day. And yeah. Caroline Bingley says, well, then it would be rather unlike a ball. In the book, I don't know if you guys remember this, the person who actually says that line about conversation being better than dancing is Caroline Bingley. Oh. And she's saying it to try to suck up to Darcy. Oh, okay. And Bingley and Bingley is like yes, but then it wouldn't be like a ball. Oh, interesting. And it, again, in in giving that line to Mary, it just adds a little bit more depth to Mary's character that she doesn't know what to do at a ball. She's like tr she's trying. Yeah. Um, and it just that really oh that just gutted me. It in it almost gives an entry point to like every different kind of person who might watch this movie because <laughs> there are going to mm -hmm. be some people who love this stuff and love the dance and then there's going to be someone who feels more like mary like i'm just i don't know about this I i'm very awkward and you have somebody that you can identify with um and i felt that way a little bit with darcy because you know he's like he doesn't really like dancing very much and he, uh <laughs> i totally feel that like i, I can do it but um you know I was, uh, one of my observations from this <laughs> Ball is all like, I'm really glad I don't have to memorize such elaborate routines. I'd be stepping on people, yeah. embarrassing <laughs> myself. Uh, it would not be it would not be pretty. Although I think I could do the sort of aloof brooding if I needed to, but because apparently that's very winning. But um, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, yeah, I, I think I would struggle. But then with Mary too, um, after Collins proposes to Elizabeth and and he's kind of in disgrace after having been. Um, after his his hand being denied there's that look mary gives him where like they would be the perfect match and again <laughs> yeah. that just kind of makes you have um sympathy for both of them in that kind of way it, so what a, what an odd i mean i know that's the whole point of this but just what an odd courting situation to be in yeah. where you're like i kind of like this person they seem somewhat interesting i think they're pretty attractive I guess I'm going to propose to them. <laughs> like That's just like yeah. how... Three months, we'll be married. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, what? Like, it's so weird to me to see it go so fast to like, we've we've barely ever spoken, but now I'm going to propose to you. Uh, and, yeah. and, and and even like, even with Darcy, although I guess the, 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 the hand and the stuff like really helps sell it more. 
when he was talking about how ardently he loves her, I was like, really? Like you, you haven't really talked to her very much. Like I, I just like my modern <laughs> sensibilities. I'm like, you don't really know her. Like you're sure you're not just in love with the idea of her. I don't know. You know, I just, but I, I know that's not this world. That's not this world. They had some people in the, uh, the sort of little documentary for the special features of this film. And they were talking about sort of the, the society at the time, how it you couldn't look like you wanted to date someone like you needed to look like you didn't you were like removed from it in a way and so and the only real time that people would let loose in ways were at balls and things like that but it was in sort of a it was still in sort of a suppressed way because like i think they talked about how like your parents would be at the at the ball as well so mm. it's like how would you be acting and you know you're letting loose and dancing with people trying to potentially court someone but at the same time, your parents are there and their parents oh are there. God. And it's so all awkward. Very, Have yeah. your parents standing there like, yeah, go talk to him. <laughs> oh, what did he say? You know, like that would just be so awkward. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, another thing that you talked about, Luke, was the choreography just in yeah. terms of learning dances and everything. They, you know, they did for this movie yeah. and like elaborate uh, large scale dances with people coming in and out of focus of the frame. So like, you know, as as Jen said, we'd be moving from person to person sort of trying to see how everybody's doing throughout. There is one specific scene, though, that we have to highlight, because while editing the scene with Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy's first dance, Joe Wright discovered that they had inadvertently gotten the entire scene in one take via a camera and place to take establishing shots. The single take version is in the finished movie. Wow. Like, wow. accidental. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which that? is really hard. I feel like that's really tough to do to accidentally, because if you have multiple cameras, some some cameraman might walk into the frame of your especially your wide establishing shot and so the fact that it's not it's not extremely wide but it is pretty wide uh and it's when they're sort of like you know it'll it'll they're they're looping and put it pushing hands together and spinning in circles so it'll go with elizabeth when she's saying something and then it'll go over to darcy when he's saying something and sort of flow back and forth as they're spinning around each other uh and you know they're dancing and you know performing lines and then yeah. also, this just happened to be all one great take that that Wright wanted to keep for the fi for the final uh, cut of the film, which is amazing and uh, <laughs> incredibly difficult to do. And it's cool to like I went back and watched the scene again. It's really honestly magical because like they they nailed it. Wow, one of those one of those movie magic moments, right? Like, <laughs> I, whenever I think about that, I mean, this isn't really on the the same kind of thing, but that moment in Jaws with the uh, shooting star that just happened to perfectly go behind him while he's and then like that became such a thing for Spielberg throughout the rest of his career. He's like putting shooting stars in all of his movies. <laughs> um, and it was like a real thing that just happened and it just perfectly went across the screen. Like the idea of just accidentally catching something like that on film is, yeah, it's just one of those magical moments. Very cool. Um, during that dance sequence, I also really liked the, there was a moment where, they are they're surrounded by people they're having this dance and then um very seamlessly transitions to them being alone on the dance floor with each other um and the the camera kind of crosses behind darcy's back and we have this moment of connection and then all of a sudden everybody's back and and um it's very it's very seamless to where you almost wouldn't notice it but um you know, I think it was very intentionally done to show that intimacy that they're able to achieve, even though they're surrounded by all these people. Yeah, that's a good point. This in this section, we also have Lady Catherine de Bourges estate, and yeah. uh, so wow. going there and Judy Dent, yeah, amazing, yeah, right. Again, like that's just and that's someone who we haven't even talked about within this cast. It just keeps going. Mm -hmm. And it's playing a character that. Uh, I talked about on our last episode her confrontation with Elizabeth, which I know we haven't quite gotten to yet, is one of my favorite scenes in the entire book, and it was one of my favorite in this movie. Um, but yeah, her introduction, she immediately sells this intimidating presence, and they, they're they sort of paraded in front of her. And you can see even Mr. Darcy is sort of cowed in front of her. He's He doesn't speak up. And she just commands the room. And honestly, Elizabeth is the only one who's willing to sort of talk back to her. And I know that that's my modern sensibilities, but I'm like clapping for Elizabeth. Yeah, talk back, um, <laughs> which I'm sure was a very bad thing to do in the day. But like, I loved it. it made me, and it made me feel a stronger connection to Elizabeth Bennett uh, in the film than 
I did, even though she does some similar stuff in the book, don't get me wrong. Um, but I just, I don't know, something about the per- performance and, and just how intimidating uh, that character is. Uh, I was cheering for it. I think, too, it shows because Lady Catherine is um, quite rude mm-hmm. to Elizabeth. Um, and propriety is such a huge deal in this society. But when you're super rich you get to define what what propriety is and what it isn't. And when you're not super rich, you don't. And I thought that that was illustrated really, really well in just in that first scene you're with Lady Catherine. I love that. You're so right. Like she ha- she is clearly on a different stratosphere because she can just be rude to people. And we haven't mm-hmm. seen anybody be like that so far. Mm-hmm. And you're like, she's just treating these people like whatever she wants. Um, and, and I, I, there was a, there was a line that I absolutely loved where she's like talking about piano playing and she's like, mm-hmm. if I had ever learned, I would have been a great talent. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, one of well, those people. When, <laughs> when she tells, uh, Mrs. Collins, you know, you, you can come practice on the piano in the servants quarters. Yeah. You'll be in no one's way in that part of the house. Yeah. You know? Yeah, just, I mean, brutal. And then and the perfectly cast person to portray this, I think. Like, I, I can't imagine anyone else quite doing this. Um, this does include our big dramatic rain sequence, right? This is something we talked about where um, Darcy initially proposes, right? And um, he he does a really good kicked puppy look when he gets turned down and you feel sorry for him. Um, but you know, like I totally get why Elizabeth says no here. She has every reason to, um, uh, from everything she's heard so far. And, you know, I thought it worked well, even though it was almost a melodramatic moment. Again, I think that fits the the subject matter. So I, yeah, I really like that scene. But, but we have to talk about that. See, this is why you need me on this podcast. <laughs> I you agree. Need the person who rewinds the scene and watches it. Okay. That moment there's this super hot moment in the <laughs> scene where he's proposed, she said no, they've both insulted each other, they're glaring at each other, and then there's this moment the- where you think they're just going to start making out, yeah. and it's amazing, yeah, it's and then close. that's it, and then they go away. It's, oh, that yes. tension is there for sure, yeah. You can, you can feel that attraction. It's, it's still there. Even though uh, their sort of rational minds are telling them, you know, at least Elizabeth mm-hmm. is telling her, no, 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 no. Um, the performances yeah. too, the, the the chemistry between the two, and the way that mm-hmm. like they're just spitting venom at each other the entire scene. She's so upset about like him breaking up his sister, yeah, and and she and he's giving it right back to her because of the whole uh, Wickham situation. Like he's mm-hmm. like, you don't know what you're ta- talking about, basically. Um, and then yeah, to come that close and and like. You don't know what's going to happen in that moment. And they just linger there for a second. I'm sure yeah. I had a feeling that that was the same the same group of people who loved that hand flex probably loved the <laughs> linger. Hand flex. Yes. Yo. Uh, yes. Matt, so Matthew McFadden, we haven't talked to him about him really much as 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 Mr. Darcy. I know a lot of people are comparing him to Colin Firth. Right. Who is a bigger name. And when it comes to acting, but like I thought he was very good. Um, he's he's handsome. He, he sells this role well. Um, well, yeah. What are your What are your thoughts on his performance as Darcy? I lo- I'm firmly Team Matthew, which is going to alienate me from a <laughs> lot of people right now. I think Colin Firth, especially at the time. Did you guys see the '95? No, no, we have we haven't seen it, but we we will. I would assume at some point. So as a bonus episode, there is a scene where he takes off his shirt, and that was a very formative experience for a lot of people. <laughs> nice. And um, but I think. At, at the time, I know it's kind of funny. I I think that at the time, you know, Colin Firth, he was kind of like a sex symbol mm. in, in, in that. And I think that Matthew McFadden does not play it that way at all. Yeah. He definitely... Um, he definitely inhabits the discomfort of Darcy in a way that I found incredibly incredibly appealing Mm -hmm. um i i really loved his interpretation and yeah there's there's definitely vicious debate on both sides but um yeah i can i feel like i vibe more with the sad boy energy too like i feel like i can relate more to that (laughs) well we haven't we haven't seen him yet we we gotta we have to withhold judgment that'll be something we can touch on when we do actually watch that other one um but yeah i mean uh 
I mean, a, 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 a tall, dark, and handsome man who's very socially awkward. I, I could definitely, <laughs> hopefully, identify with that. Right? <laughs> Hey, my wife said that uh, I remind her of Mr. Darcy, so I'll take that. <laughs> there you go. Very, Very go. sweet of her. Okay, so moving into this next section, Elizabeth returns home, as does Jane. Accompanying the gardeners on a visit to the Peak District, Elizabeth reluctantly tours Pemberley, the Grand Darcy estate. She runs into Darcy, who invites her and the gardeners to dine at Pemberley. Darcy's manner has softened considerably, his manners impressing the gardeners, and Georgiana sharing her brother's flattering reports about Elizabeth. An urgent letter from Jane reveals that Lydia has run off with Wickham. Darcy leaves abruptly, and Elizabeth returns home, certain she will never see Darcy again. Her mother fears Lydia's disgrace will ruin her other daughter's chances for good marriages. After a tense waiting period, Mr. Gardner sends news that Lydia and Wickham are now married, and the newlyweds return to them. Lydia lets slip to Elizabeth that it was Darcy who found them and paid for their wedding. He also purchased Wickham's military commission. Bingley and Darcy return to Netherfield and visit Longbourn. Bingley proposes to Jane, who accepts. Late that night, Lady Catherine arrives to see Elizabeth and demands she never become engaged to Darcy. Deeply insulted, Elizabeth orders her to leave the house. Walking the moor early the next morning, Elizabeth encounters Darcy, who apologizes for his aunt's intrusion. He professes his continued love, and Elizabeth, her feelings radically altered, accepts his proposal. She tells her father the truth of Darcy's actions, and Mr. Bennett gives Elizabeth his consent to marry. Overjoyed, she has found love. I mean, so many cool scenes in this last bit here. One I want to highlight is one of the laugh out loud moments I had. And that was when uh, Darcy and Bingley arrive at the house and uh the, uh someone sees them coming and then the mother just starts arranging all of her daughters and everyone's like hopping around and like uh, arranging their ribbons and uh, you need to go sit down like what and it's the chaos uh, uh, it's just it's so much craziness going on and then they come in and they're just primly sitting there like they, oh yes we've just been here this is how we sit around all the time and i legitimately laughed out loud it was so funny that's a hundred percent my favorite scene as well um <laughs> so i was gonna comment on it it's so it's so awesome because we're seeing them as they actually are you right. know what i mean they're all laying all over the couch however and like you know they have trash and like whatever all over the place and then quickly clean up and they're sitting and that's another shot that reminds me of almost a painting right and then the the a scene immediately following that was also a funny scene where bingley he's all off his game and he's nervous and they leave and then you see him and that's that scene with him and Darcy by the lake mm -hmm. but he's like we were gonna go in and she was gonna say sit down and you know yeah. he has to kind of coach so her good. through no 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 this is what you do it's okay and I think that those those are the modern updates right like those yeah. small mm -hmm. things make it just bring that little comedic uh relief that maybe helps out a modern viewer in a way and I, I thought that those were like extremely smart and so I, I feel like this is this is not something that is probably going to affect most viewers. But for me, I was still not completely sold on Darcy as someone that I like. But this is one of the moments that sold like this is a side of him I hadn't seen yet. And I was still waiting to see and him helping his friend out, like being a genuine friend here. And yeah. um, the way he's like sort of humoring him, but also like encouraging him and helping him psych himself up, uh, I think, for this proposal. Yeah, I, I really like that. And like, I, I guess I was still like, I knew that who he was, like, obviously, Darcy is the main love interest, and we're supposed to like him. But I was like, I, I hadn't seen enough to feel affection for the character yet. And this is one of the moments that helped me get there. Like, I was like, okay, I do really what like What about Darcy. when he, uh, when he's, uh, when he, you see him with Georgiana the first time? Remind when me. When she... When Elizabeth is touring the house and she's kind of spying on Georgiana at the piano and then Georgiana notices her brother is there and he gives her a big hug and spins oh, yeah. her around. Yeah. That for me was a, a great You're scene right, too, you're right. Because you see him for the first time feeling comfortable. Yeah, the, and those little glimpses of like his natural state really helps mm -hmm. because he he always is putting on so so much like he's got a he's got a performance that he's kind of putting on mm -hmm. and yeah when you see like the real person behind that it, it does help yeah that, that's another good one you're right in the book we get sort of the house and his like servants speaking for themselves and that sort of representing 
him as a person beyond like what we've seen of Darcy. I, I thought it was smart in order to like sell his personality more than his estate, even though like clearly the estate was supposed to be sort of an, a metaphor for himself. Yeah. In the and book. It, I think it is also still there's a wish fulfillment piece yeah. of this story. It's like kind of a fairy tale and it's kind of that joy of like, what would it be like to live in it? You know, it's not it's not practical to for everyone to have a giant castle, but like everyone can appreciate like what would that feel like? It would be amazing, right? Like it would be such a gorgeous place and um for a moment you get to just kind of imagine and, and I think there's a, a cool kind of look at Elizabeth as she's kind of walking in through the house going, This is what I kind of gave up. Um maybe mm-hmm. I Maybe I was a fool when I said no. Um, um, s- some of my favorite things, too, are the... This is jumping ahead a little bit, but the realization of... So her family... I loved holding it, withholding the fact that she liked Darcy from her family the entire way through up until the very end when she starts revealing it and they're all surprised by it. I yeah. thought that, that was really strong as well. And it gave it like a... It gave it more... I, I think that is kind of a change, right? Uh, yeah. Well, she had told Jane in the book. Right. She didn't tell anyone else, but... Um, but yeah, in the movie, she doesn't even tell Jane. And that sort of like finishes out. I feel like it ni- gets a nice bow on the end of the family relationship and how everybody's feeling about everything. And and overall, it's to to be able to have that scene with Donald Sutherland where, where uh, he like gives his blessing, that yeah. scene's amazing as well. I, I, I just thought that was really, that's the point where I like was starting to tear up for sure. There were a couple I, I did, times. I did, I did during sure. that. That was that was my moment. Um, you know, there were a couple times where I was feeling a little misty eyed, but yeah, Donald Sutherland's, the love he has for his daughter there and the joy he clearly feels when he realizes her genuine affection for Darcy. And like, that's clearly what he like has always wanted. You do get the sense that she is maybe a favorite. Like he, he oh, just, she's totally, his you know, favorite. Yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> yeah, like that, that just is such a, such a cool moment. It's very similar to the book, but like that performance mm-hmm. that Donald Sutherland gives is moving. Um, I really liked it. And and there's another scene where uh, it's another one of those tracking shots where you see all the windows outside the house, where you see him talking to his wife. They're lounging in bed talking. Yeah. And in the book, it's kind of clear that they don't get along. Necess- like they were married. Now they're just kind of inhabiting the house. And he's kind of, he's just this long suffering guy. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um but there's that moment in the in the movie where they they have a real connection where they, where they clearly have affection for each other which i really enjoyed i i do have to say in that last scene with Kara Knightley this is going to sound so picky but um oh donald sutherland's teeth oh his teeth are so white <laughs> they're so straight and uh. so white and so obvious mm-hmm. against his his face is kind of shadowed and I I do have to say that in terms of like historical authenticity, yeah. that I was like, wait a minute, there's no yeah. <laughs> like it like let him drink some coffee or something <laughs> before the shot so that they're not so blinding. I him. did have the uh, as I normally do. I did have the moment just like seeing some of the characters and thinking about how everyone probably smelled. Um, yeah. Like that, I did have that moment <laughs> while watching it. Yeah. That reminds me, there, there's a moment where Elizabeth shows up and her hair is like loose and flowing. She's been walking outside and my wife pointed this out, like, that doesn't seem like someone would have their hair like that at all in this time period. It seems anachronistic to to have your hair down like that. Like, it, it seemed almost modern. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, it just, yeah, because you've seen like how people's hair looked in that period, you know, buns and very up, up and uh, tightly wound. And the idea of like a loose flowing hair just probably wasn't accurate. So we have a massive scene we have to touch on. And that's the more scene at, in the early morning, which is kind of the big climax of it all. Yeah. I would love to hear your guys thoughts on it. So when you were, I'll talk about this one too, because, oh my God, that, that like indrawn breath or that, that just that little, when she sees him walking across the field mm-hmm. was so perfect. Um, I also thought, you know, obviously they're not they're not smooching yet because they're not officially married. That scene at the end where he they kind of touch foreheads and the light mm-hmm. is coming from behind yeah, them. Yeah, sunrise. So beautiful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely so beautiful. 
I yeah, love, and you yes. can't fake that. You can't fake that shot either, right? Because you're yeah. looking at mm-hmm. a light. Otherwise, that's they had to wait for the sun, get the perfect moment of the sunlight through their silhouettes. I was wondering about that. I'm like, how many times, how many mornings did they have to come out here and try and get this scene just right? Um, because it all felt very natural. And and again, like you said, like that was clearly the real sun uh, that they right. used there. So yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, I love that scene. You know. Uh, the, the emerging from the mist, um, it, it's very otherworldly almost. Um, it, but again, it, it looks it, great. It fits the too. fairy tale nature of the story. Yeah. It also makes me realize that like the, a scene like this differentiates itself from other romance f- films, right? Like, so the morning mist is different than the kissing in the rain from the Notebook or something mm-hmm. like that. Like, it's like having that morning mist over the over the moor or whatever is so. It's like the copyright of this movie. You know what I mean? Like it's so when you think of this movie, you'll think of that scene. And I think that that's really smart in terms of like having the fog and having it be so memorable because it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have one more scene that I would like to talk to you guys about, because apparently the very final scene with the newlyweds uh, where they're sitting out in front of their property or whatever. Apparently that scene wasn't included in the UK release of the film. I have thoughts on it. I'll let you yeah. guys go first. I want to hear what you think of that scene as well. So, uh, yeah, that scene, I, I I, had notes. I was like, this almost feels, it feels very modern. It almost feels American. So it's funny that you said that uh, that they removed it from the British version of this film. Um, it's very, it's such a, d- a huge display of affection that feels inappropriate almost for this movie. Yet, it's a release of all that built up, pent up, uh, moments that we've been talking about and so i liked it um but i can see how maybe some people it's like almost too much um it is it is definitely it it almost feels like a separate thing like it almost doesn't quite fit this story but uh, my modern sensibilities like to see it because otherwise it can be a little frustrating it's like they're almost kissing almost kissing almost kissing and then they never do like I don't know. It would it would have almost been frustrating that way, which I guess the ver- there's a version out there that that exists. Um, so for me, it worked. Although I, I I guess I can see why some people might not like it. Um, and it did feel like a modern touch that I don't know if you were referencing earlier, James. Like maybe maybe it won't age well. I don't know, but it, it did feel like uh, brought in for like the modern audience is going to expect something like this. I love that. Scene. <laughs> 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 That's a big surprise, right? Um, no, I love it. Cause I think, I think, I mean, I do understand why it was not in the UK version. Um, it's clearly not in the book. Yeah. Um, but so much of Austin, I mean, they're romances, right? And, and so much of these romances are about anticipation. Um, cause you know, they're, they're going to be together in the end cause it's a romance. Um, but you don't get to see it until the very end. And, and, you know, at one time, marriage was the culmination of that tension. And not necessarily now. Do you know what I mean? Like, if that's not necessarily what we're waiting to see, we're waiting to see the kiss. And I thought that it was so, I mean, they're not like, it's a very chaste little kiss, you know what I mean? It's it's not anything that's that's overdone. It's very tender. It's also it shows them still kind of bantering with each other, but it shows their reserve is is broken down a little bit. He's not wearing any shoes. Um They're standing on a I table, think, I think. It's kind of odd. <laughs> yeah, they're sitting on a table, yes. Um, or a platform of yeah, some kind. Just enjoying yeah. their massive estate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As one does, yeah. you know. Um, but I I really I mean, yes, again, I am not an Austin purist at all. Um, I totally loved that scene mm. and I I yeah. did think it was the perfect ending for this movie. Well, I'm glad that we all have different perspectives on on it. <laughs> um, so it's not that I don't like it, and I like the intimacy of it. I like seeing the the like the ending of the relationship that we've seen so far. But it did feel like a little bit too much for me. Like Luke was talking about, like it kind of felt out of place. Um, like it was almost left to me. I felt like it was. I, I would have walked away having that sort of some of the final things be the the more scene and then the family scenes. And then we can kind of just leave from there. But that cutting to them together just felt like a lot to me. It didn't feel like it really fit 
in the tone of this, the rest of the story because it it is just so different. It's like you've been talking about how the anticipation is there the whole way. And to draw this comparison, the book was sort of, sort of more of Elizabeth's perspective on the whole relationship. And I felt like this movie was more of a peek into their relationship. And so I feel like I would have appreciated just like stepping back and walking away from it um, without it feeling like we're getting more than is necessary. But, you know, it kind of just hit me that way at that time. Maybe that day I it wasn't for me. I don't yeah. know. I, and I think I'm somewhere in between the two because... Um... He kisses her like four or five times on her face, um, mm-hmm. saying Mrs. Darcy over and over again. That felt very intimate. That felt almost like something in the bedroom, right? Like you, you Agreed, it's a yeah. very intimate, very sexy moment. Um, that is almost what's almost too much. Um, I agree, yeah. it, it's not that I didn't like it. You know what I mean? It's just like, it, it, as far as we were talking about it fitting in this movie. Um, but I absolutely love the intimacy in the relationship that is on display here because we have not seen or we have no indication and this is something in the book too no indication of what they're going to be like as a couple Mm -hmm. and this is our only moment where they're having that back and forth where you get a feel for like what is this relationship going to be like going forward and that i absolutely loved um so even if i was a little maybe more on the fence about it um, that part I think it was was perfect. So yeah, I'm kind of I guess more mixed on it, but um, I can see what both of you are saying. I do appreciate the return to the hand though. Also, we yeah. talked about the hand a lot, and then she grabs his hand and kisses it. Like I thought that was a clever clever bit there at the end as well. And that was super intimate too. Yeah. In that scene in the moors when she just takes his hand and kisses his hand, yeah. that was very very intimate. Um, yeah. We skipped over a scene that I, I want to go back to just because we I, we can't we can't not talk about Lady Catherine <laughs> showing oh, yes. up and the 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 argument they have. Um, she shows up in all of her power and she is just like in a in a in a rage almost, but it's very tightly controlled. And um, the way that you know she disarms her father, she disarms the entire family is incredibly rude to them. And comes in to have this confrontation with Elizabeth, who she expects to be cowed, and she's just not. And um, again, uh, this is a moment I absolutely cheered for Elizabeth. She stands up to her, and um, you know, is not cowed by this woman. And it is ironic that this ends up being one of the ways that that Darcy finds out about her still feeling this way. But I don't. Know, I just it's so good. Judy Dench is so scary here. Um, and I, I don't know. What what were your thoughts on this on this scene? I thought it was incredible. Um, I talked about it before. Extremely intense. Uh, I The only thing that I wish is that we got the line from the book because I thought the line from the book was so smart about, I can't, of course, I'm going to butcher it right now, but basically it was, uh, I'm not going to promise something about her happiness. And I mentioned in the book how it showed agency in her in her choice to be with Darcy. And I think I was anticipating it for, for the film. Mm. And that's maybe why I felt mm. a little bit like I wish I, I had seen it. I don't remember exactly what line you're talking about. Um, I, and I do know that several of the things she says is right out of the book. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess I wasn't left missing anything. But um, yeah, I don't know. What, what were your thoughts on that scene, Jen? Oh, I, I adored that scene. Um, yeah, I, I mean, she Judy Dench is just, she's just so good. And just she she is such a commanding presence when she comes in and she says, the rest of your offspring, yeah. I presume, just so condescending and just, um, yes. Yeah, so, so, and I, and I did like how, you know, Elizabeth basically calls her out on her rudeness. Yeah. You know, you are, you are being insulting. Yeah. The um, most, it's like, no one has ever insulted me as much as you have. Ex- yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah, she walks into their house like she owns it and she treats mm-hmm. Mr. Bennett like he's nobody and totally mm-hmm. disarms him. And, and that was intimidating to me. Cause like you expect, like, it's like, this is his house, you know, like he should be able to, but no, she just storms in there, you know, don't even speak to me. Um, like she owns the place and it, it's really incredible. And then, yeah, uh, I, I loved it. Did you, did you find the line James? And you tell me if this is in the movie or not, cause I'll be embarrassed if it was, <laughs> but this is, this is the line. Okay. I have no such thing. I am only resolved to act in that manner, which will, in my own opinion, constitute my happiness without reference to you or to any person so wholly unconnected with me. Huh. That was not. I don't think that was in there. Yeah. I mean, and and that's another one of those lines that 
it, I don't know that that that's it's very convoluted. <laughs> so I, I don't know how clearly it reads reads on the screen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying. You know, there there was some some great moments that have to be left out in the adaptation. Um, so I can see missing some lines, but. I, I think we gotta we gotta wrap this thing. Um, we we have arrived at the end, and uh, we like to cast our votes for what the better version of the story was. I know this is kind of a silly thing to do, but we're gonna do it because I don't know. Maybe it's interesting. Um, and yeah. we're gonna have you go last, Jen. Um, might be a time Thank you. breaker. I've been dreading this, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, and, yeah. And, honestly, and, my opinion on it is just like rip the band-aid off and just pick one because ultimately like <laughs> you're going to make some people mad no matter what you say yeah, yeah. and uh ultimate and, and i think a lot of times we give the caveat that like both were great and yeah. it's not even it, it might edge it out or something like that yeah. in this moment in time yeah mm -hmm. so all of those caveats being said uh james you want to start yeah i'll start so even though i said uh, you know i think near nearing the end here i was giving some things that i that i wasn't responding as well to but even so i'm picking the movie here and it's because of it's not necessarily the artistic piece that either are. It's more the way that I responded to them as a modern viewer. So like we've talked about it throughout the whole, the podcast up to this point, but it was it was the modern sensibilities for for humor. It was the cinematography, which I loved. Uh, the performances and the the cast was incredible. And just overall, I think the attention to detail was there and. It's it might not be the perfect like uh, every detail from Jane Austen's novel in the adaptation, but I think that it's extremely respectful of the source material. And of course, I have to say Jane Austen's novel is potentially one of the greatest novels of all time. Everyone is supposed to read it. You know, it's and I talked about how it was such a blind spot for us last episode. And so now to have have having read it, I understand. And it's incredible. Uh, but to my modern sensibilities, I'm taking the movie this time. OK. Uh, so I was sort of struck with a forlornness at the end of this movie, a sadness, and it was very unusual, right? Because it's such a good, such a, such a warm movie, but I kept thinking about Jane Austen, the person, and how disconnected she was from her fame, from her, um, getting read. Like she, she didn't live to see any of this. And this movie is like another culmination of everything that people love about her. And yet she never got to experience, never got to know. And that the idea of her writing this book, um, anonymous publishing it anonymously, not even being able to put her name on it because of the expectations of society at the time. It's just so, it's so tragic. Um, and I, I don't know. I just really felt for her. Um, but all that being said, <laughs> oh um, boy, I am going to agree with you, James. Uh, this movie sold the story for me in a way that the book just didn't quite for for my modern sensibilities. Um, and I think it it took a movie of this quality to outshine because if this had just been, I don't know if I was expecting a lesser movie, but I I normally go into movies with expectations that they're just going to be okay and and i was really impressed with the craft that went into this film the attention to detail um and the artistry on display and it, it took an a adaptation of this caliber to outshine the book for me um with all the caveats of of course the source material came first and it, it we owe it all to jane austen um i am going to take the movie here as well Luke, just you talking about her life reminded me something I wanted to say. There, There's a, a movie about her life mm. I was seeing. I don't know the title of it, but I think it would be awesome to cover as a bonus yeah. episode or something in the future because I, she's such an interesting person and I'd love to cover more of her stuff. Completely agree. All right, Jen. So where where are <laughs> you with this one? So, um, yeah, I, I'm going with the movie ripping that bandaid off and and i know it's funny because i uh, you know as i i'm a former english professor and and i i can't believe i'm saying this but you know i really enjoyed rereading the book um but i would also sit down tonight and watch the movie again if i had someone to watch it with it is Luke, you were saying how warm and comforting it was, and that's that's what it is for me. It is a it is a comfort movie for me. 
I did think that the the book as as it's it's witty. The book is so witty and intelligent and sharp. Um, the movie has a softness to it that I really really enjoyed, and that got me in the feels quite yeah. a lot more mm -hmm. so yeah so that's why that's why i'm going with the movie so don't at me that's my <laughs> that's my choice <laughs> uh unanimous then for the film um but shout out to jane austen of course um and i and you know I, I hope we return to her at some point and uh we have several different options for some bonus material which will be on our patreon uh so stay tuned for that but uh speaking of adding you uh jen where can people find you online uh, if they did want to oh, talk hello. to you about this uh, about this project or your writing, which they should totally check out? So I am on Twitter. That's where you can most easily find me um, online. And my um, username is right Run Yoga. So W-R-I-T-E-R-U-N-Y-O-G-A. And um, you can also check out my website which is jenniferhudakwrites.com. Um, there you'll find links to all of my published work. Um, yeah, so those two places are where I mostly am. Very cool. Okay, thank you, Jen, so much for joining us. It was a joy, and you brought tons of information and great perspectives. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad to have someone from my VP class on. I'm sure I'll have some more on in the future. <laughs> Um, and if you if you like uh, Pride and Prejudice, you should check out Jen's uh, story in Metaphorosis, The Art of Unpicking Stitches. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Jen. And uh, I'll see you. I'll see you around. Sounds good. Take care. All right. So stick around for the end of the episode where we'll be announcing our next project. Um, if you enjoyed this project, though, and you enjoyed our coverage of Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to this. If you're on YouTube, like the video, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, also, just throw a comment. Let us know what you liked. Um, we appreciate that. We always enjoy the feedback. Um, so, yeah, definitely engage. And make sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those at Ink to Film. And as we mentioned before, we do have a Patreon where we do bonus content, uh, other adaptations, uh, ad adjacent stuff, like maybe a biopic, which we did for Tolkien. Um, so that kind of thing, experimental episodes and videos. Um, check out our Patreon if that interests you uh, at patreon.com slash ink to film. Thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. Okay, here we are at the end. Uh, we get to, dis to, to announce our next project, which is going to be quite a different vibe than this one. Um, we are going to be tackling Candyman, the mm -hmm. Clive Barker adaptation. Uh, we are actually going to cover the 1992 film first. Uh, we'll be reading the, it's a kind of a short story no novelette. I'm not really sure of the length. Um, story by Barker and the 92 film will be our next episode. And then we'll follow that up with the new film. I'm not sure how we're going to see it yet. Maybe we'll sneak into a theater uh, during a matinee or something. I wish <laughs> that we were not in a situation where going to the theater was still a little dicey, but you know that's the world we live in to these days. Um, yeah, but I, I, I miss it. Yeah, um, I, I, I will hopefully find a way to see this movie um, that I'm comfortable with, <laughs> so that we could talk about it. But um, I'm very excited. I mean, it looks cool. I don't know yeah. anything really about Candyman um, other than I've just heard the name. So I'm really interested to, to dive into it and find out the history. You haven't seen the original film? I haven't seen the original. Oh, wow. Yeah, man. I'm coming in completely, completely new to it. I guess you've seen that. That sounds like. Yeah. Okay. I have. So you know a little something, but I know next to nothing. We haven't covered Barker since Rawhead Rex way back, uh, way back in like season, the start of season two or something. So. It's been a while. He'll be fun to return to him. And yeah, uh, uh, Barker is about as different a writer as Jane Austen as you can get. So uh, yeah. this will be this will be quite a, a, a change. And I'm, I'm not sure how many overlapping fans there are here at the end. Who are going to check it out, but <laughs> people um, who are fans of story, Luke. Exactly. Yes. Be like us. We like story and uh, it should be a good one. So uh, make sure to check that out. And until next time, keep adapting. Keep adapting.